Hillary Rodham Clinton, but everyone has done that already. But I always believe if it's worth doing once, it's worth doing again. So if everyone could now warmly... <laughs> Thank you. I certainly feel warmly welcomed, and I'm delighted to be here with all of you. I want to thank the Secretary General uh, for his leadership on these issues over the uh, years of his tenure. We greatly appreciate it. Everyone at the United Nations, the Commission on the Status of Women, UN Women, the UN Global Compact, uh, for holding this gathering, which comes at such a pivotal moment in the cause of gender equality. I think it's fair to say we are here to build on the progress of the past and seize the promise of the future. And it is an honor as I look across this hall to see so many leaders from business, diplomacy, government, civil society, a real gathering of those who share this commitment. I want to thank you all, each and every one of you, because women and men who understand that gender equality is not just morally right, but is the smart thing to do, are growing in number. We may be approaching, in some areas, critical mass, but we have to keep making the same case over and over again. What we are doing here today is smart for companies, and smart for countries. That is the wisdom behind the women's empowerment principles. So thank you. Thank you all for your leadership. Now some of you, as I gaze out, were with me in Beijing back in 1995 at the Fourth World Conference on Women, where remarkably representatives from 189 nations pledged to work for an ambitious goal. The full participation of women and girls in every aspect of society. Together, as the Secretary General said, we called out with one voice, human rights are women's rights, and women's rights are human rights once and for all. And the world began to listen. Out of Beijing came the platform for action. And in many parts of the world, it was an organizing document. Women and men could see what needed to be done and where they could help to make change happen. In the years that followed, we not only saw change across the world, we saw the creation of UN Women, and the passage of Security Council rec resolutions recognizing the crucial role of women in peacemaking and security. We saw institutions like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund focus on the untapped potential of women to drive economic growth and social progress. We passed laws prohibiting violence against women electing women at all levels of government, working together to make significant strides in closing gaps in health and education. Now, 20 years later, it is not only time to take stock, but it is our job to keep the ambition of Beijing alive, to keep marching forward. Yesterday, the Clinton Foundation and the Gates Foundation announced a sweeping new report that marshals 20 years of data from around the world to document how far we've come and how far we still have to go. All the evidence tells us that despite the obstacles that remain, there's never been a better time in history to be born female. A girl born in Lesotho 20 years ago could not hope to one day own property or sign a contract. Today she can. 
If she were born in Nepal or Afghanistan, there was a tragically high chance that her mother would die in childbirth. Today, that is far less likely. A girl born 20 years ago in Rwanda grew up in the shadow of genocide and rape. Today, she can be proud that women have led the way out of that dark time, and now there are more women serving in her country's parliament than anywhere else in the world. Today, thanks to the efforts of so many, women and girls have a much greater chance to live healthy and secure lives. But, and you knew there'd be a but, but the data also leads to a second conclusion. Despite all this progress, we're still not there yet. We're not there yet when we've nearly closed the global gender gap in primary school, but more than 30 million girls never go on to secondary school. We're not there yet when every year more than one million girls are never born because of gender-biased sex selection, mainly in China and India. We're not there yet when despite having increased the number of countries prohibiting domestic violence from just 13 in 1995 up to 76 today, more than half the nations in the world still have no laws on the books, and an estimated one in three women is still subjected to violence. All the laws we've passed don't count for much if they're not enforced. Rights have to exist in practice, not just on paper. And laws have to be backed up with resources and political will with prosecutors and police officers and judges trained and committed to enforcement. They have to be made real in people's lives. As our new report documents, deep-seated cultural codes and structural biases continue to hold back the full participation of women and girls and expose them to discrimination and abuse. I hope you'll explore the data yourself at noceilings.org. It's designed for casual visitors to gain insights quickly or for committed activists and researchers to dive deep. We want these statistics and the stories they represent to open eyes, stir debate, and spur action. So please visit, learn, share, tweet, organize, mobilize, join us in making absolutely clear that the full participation of women and girls is the great unfinished business of the 21st century, and not just for women, for everyone. We know that the only way to achieve broad-based growth and prosperity in a competitive and interdependent world is to build economies and societies that work for everyone and include everyone. We can't afford to leave any talent on the sidelines. Take the United States. If we closed the gap in workforce participation between men and women, our economy would grow by nearly 10%. And the numbers are significant for other economies as well. That's the power of full participation, particularly in the business sector and particularly in the formal business sector, where, as the Secretary General pointed out, it can be measured. It can go into the gross domestic product, not just change lives and families, but lift up societies and propel economies. We've proven that progress is possible, but we can't preach just to ourselves. We do have to reach out to men, to religious communities, and as we're doing here, to businesses, to every partner we can find, and present that evidence. We need a strong goal on gender equality, and we need to integrate gender equality throughout all of the goals of the Global Sustainable Development Goals. It's important to do that because if it's not there, if it's not measured, 
there will be less of a force behind change. So let us make sure that in the global sustainable development goals, we zero in on the continuing gaps affecting gender. So from our perspective, now that we look back 20 years, I think we can be gratified that we have stuck together as a world, that we have continued to make the case and found new ways of making it. You know, I have to say, when I was Secretary of State and I would speak with my colleagues across the world about these issues, there was a moment when I often saw their eyes glaze over. And I could almost read their minds. Yes, I know she's going to talk to me about women. <laughs> and I just have to put a smile on my face, and we'll get through this and go on to the important issues. That began to change as we saw more evidence, particularly about economic growth and the role the private sector can play in including more women and unleashing their talents and ambitions. From satellite television to Tumblr, technology is also helping to bring this to the attention of everyone. The momentum for change is here, but now we have to decide how we're going to respond. So I applaud all of you who have not just passed laws, but changed minds, not just mobilized data to make a case, but resources to make a difference, who have reached throughout your societies and throughout international organizations to ensure that the lives and stories of women are never lost. Bringing women and girls off the margins and into the mainstream of every profession as well as every community and every country, has to be our mission now. The progress of the past 20 years was not an accident. It took commitment, it took accountability, it took unity, it took a lot of hard work. And the United States has a responsibility and continues to lead on these issues and to make our own country a real beacon for what is possible whether that's equal pay for equal work or encouraging more women to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, or mathematics, or defending a woman's right to make her own reproductive health decisions. We have to be on the front lines with all of you. These issues remain deeply personal for me. My late mother was born before women in the United States could vote. She came of age at a time when there were very few avenues for education or employment for women, but she had real grit and grace. And she gave me the conviction that no matter what the challenges the world throws at you, you had to work hard, have integrity, provide service to others, create a life that you would be proud of. And we know there are so many women whose names will never be in the headlines like my mother. And we can all stop for a minute and just think about the women who we have known, the teachers, the parents, the mentors, who have made a difference for us. Now it is our turn to do that for the next generation. Some of you who were there in Beijing will remember driving out to join the thousands of activists who'd been sent to a separate site about an hour outside of the city. Women were standing for hours in the torrential rains, mud up to their knees, waiting to get into an old theater. They were, of course, a little frustrated, but they were determined. And once they got inside, they sang, they clapped, they cheered, demanding equal rights and equal opportunity. That's what we have to keep in mind. All of those women and men who are on the front lines, who are doing the sometimes dangerous work of actually living equality, of holding up 
the possibility of freedom. I'm excited by where we are and particularly that we have brought in so many businesses who understand the role that they can play. And now, of course, that I'm a grandmother, I want to make sure that all children have those same opportunities to live up to their own God-given potential. And that's up to us to make sure the world they inherit is worthy of them. So thank you for keeping up the mission. Thank you for having the purpose that brings you here today. And let's keep working until we can finally say the unfinished business of the 21st century is done. Thank you all. <laughs>